special. My goodness. All right, here we go now. Dan Sean to see our pal, uh, Hall of Famer, uh, Boston Globe forever. This is a guy who loves baseball, covers all the sports. He's up in Beantown. We got a lot to do with him. We'll do the Hall of Fame in a minute. He does have a vote, of course, forever. But let's start with the Red Sox. And, Dan, nice to have you with us. Uh, listen, we all know this is a move they had to make. They could not allow Devers to walk. But I'll tell you what surprised me. They got, you know, for the going rate, I know $300 million is crazy. But for the going rate, they made a good deal with Devers. I thought it might cost them more. It's he retire. The contract ends when he's 37. I yeah. think basically the team did well with this contract. Let's discuss that first. Go ahead. I Let agree with I agree with that, Chris. I mean, you know, he kind of had him over a barrel after the best thing, the Bogarts thing. I mean, this is the next guy, and uh, all their stars are gone. And he comes up at a good time. He's 26 years old, like you say. Uh, he's been one of the most productive hitters in baseball. Kind of a you know, a little Juan Soto going on there. So, yeah, I think that uh, they, they responded and they did the right thing here. And this is a, the first good news Red Sox Nation's had in a while. Yeah, indeed. Now, uh, if they did, I, I guess the question is, was the outcry about losing Bogarts, was that why they did this? If they had signed Bogarts, would they have allowed this to sit into next, uh, at the end of the season, and then relook at where they stood with Devers? Or do you think losing Bogarts made them realize, A, we got a little more money, and B, we can't lose both? Let me hear your take on how the Bogarts fallout resulted in this contract. Yeah, I think so. They've been talking to Devers for a while, and, and clearly once they lost Bogarts, they could not afford to lose the third guy in four years. You know, franchise guys, drafted and developed by them, signed by them. So this was going to happen. Devers had him over a barrel. They responded accordingly. And, uh, yeah, there was increasing heat around here. You know, John Henry goes to the Winter Classic where his Pittsburgh Penguins are playing at Fenway Park and gets booed at Fenway Park. Two days later, they sign Devers. Cause and effect, I don't know. They've been talking a long time. But clearly, they wanted to have some good news in this horrible offseason. And they, and they got a little bit, so we like that. And they went down to the Dominican Republic. I'll tell you something else, too, Dan. I kind of like what they've done. They, their bullpen last year was horrific. And I think Martin's good. And Jansen, I, I know he's got some age on him, but one thing about Jansen, he's got a lot of guts. He bounced back from that Dodgers situation where they didn't use him in the postseason in 19. He know, He's been around. I like him. And I think Turner has got a little something to prove. You know, he kind of fall out of way there in L.A. I think he's going to be a good addition, plus the leadoff guy from Japan. I actually think the Red Sox have made some good additions if you subtract the Bogarts thing. Let me get your thoughts there. Well, I, I understand what you're saying. I think they're worse than they were last year when they finished in last place for the second time in three years and the fifth time in 11 years. But, yeah, those those are nice efforts. They're kind of getting guys, Chris, late in their careers on one- and two-year contracts. That's your Turner, that's your Jensen, that's your Kluber, that kind of thing. And it's really, who do they have in the lineup that scares you? What is that lineup? I mean, it's they lost story this week. It's The lineup's preposterous right now. It's a triple-A lineup. And, uh, again, Devers is the only guy that anyone's heard of that you want to go pay to see. I mean, I understand Turner was a guy a few years ago, but this is uh, this is not a not a, a fearsome uh, uh, murderer's row for the rest of the American League to face. They're lucky they only face the AL East less times than they did in prior years. That's going to help them. Yeah, because the AL East killed them last year. You made me think of it. Now, listen, uh, somebody has to explain to me when they were bad last year and they could have done this a long time ago. January 10th, Trevor Story decides to go have his elbow restored and he misses most of this year. It's not like the Red Sox won a World Series. He had issues when he signed with the Red Sox with this elbow. What happened here? This is horrific timing. Explain. This is, this is front office malpractice in my view. This is not, a, not forgivable, not excusable. I mean, they overpaid for the guy. He was the last guy out there. They'd given that money to Bogarts last year. They could have solved the shortstop issue. They didn't do that. They signed Story to, to make things right. He has a, a bad year, an injury-plagued year. And you're right. When they got him, the elbow thing was an issue. People knew that. They said, well, second base is a good solution for him. He's not going to have to make that throw in the hole, a shortstop, going across his body. But I had I talked to Jeff Bagwell and, and Craig Bijo in Cooperstown in July. They said, this guy's going to need surgery. He can't make the throws. And then they shut him down in September. Why didn't they do the surgery then? Was it just based on hope? I mean, the fact that he goes this far into the winter and then a month for spring training, 
they announced surgery, and you probably lose the guy for the year. I mean, they're not saying that, but they're saying we're not counting on him at all this year. So basically, another year without a shortstop. Chris, they have a catcher, shortstop, second base, center field. There's no one who's ever played more than 80 games at those positions in their up-the-middle core. I mean, you don't go anywhere with a team like that. Yeah, 100%. Uh, you know, you want to blame a front office, you're probably right. Story's got to take some responsibility for this, too, because he yeah. probably told him, well, let me try to rehab it. So, well, hold on now, Trevor. I mean, geez, you signed $140 million. <laughs> get the darn thing taken care of. I don't understand that whatsoever. Okay, we get the Red Sox out of the way. We got issues with them, but, you know, we do think that the Devers move was a, an essential <laughs> one. Away we go. You and I, believe it or not, Dan, I know you probably don't want to hear this for some wacky talk show host. You and I have been on the same page forever with the Hall of Fame, and none more than this year. You only voted for one person. I would have done the same thing. Jeff Kent never gets any love, but you continue to put him down on your ballot. You did again in 2023. Explain. Go ahead. I came, I came around late to him like a lot of people. He got, He's up to like 50%. He's not going to get in. It's 10th year in the ballot. I understand that. But it, as a guy who doesn't vote for the suspected cheaters and, and, and average players who people petition for the Hall of Fame, or good players, I should say, my standards are high, but Kent, I mean, you can make a case. He's, he's a uh, number one at second base and homers and RBIs. He was an MVP. That's a good credential. I mean, he, he matches up pretty well with Joe Morgan and Ryan Sandberg who are in the hall. He's got a better war than Bobby Dorr. If you like that sort of thing, uh, doesn't get much love. I understand he wasn't a whiz defensively. That's a little overrated at second base. I'm not too worried about that. And to me, he, you can you can make a vote for him. Now, Theo Epstein told me last winter, he said, not the hill to die on, Jeff Kent, Dan. And he's probably right about that. But on a ballot where you got to hold your nose for the most part, this is the guy that I, I can I can see steer clear through. And I'm I'm thankful that the next couple of years, you know, we're going to get Maurer on the ballot. Beltre is going to be on the ballot. Ichiro is going to be in the ballot. That'll feel a lot better. Yeah, bottom line is I saw Ken play every game as a giant, 97 to 2002, every game, 4 o'clock in the morning. And none of the people who love the metrics could say that, and I did. That's 25 years ago, and I can't recall more. I can't recall any game where his defense cost us a big spot, never once, and he always hit in the postseason. So I don't understand it either. If you had a vote for a second one, who would it have been? Again, I mean, we know I can count, Chris. So I, I know that A-Rod, Manny, Sheffield have Hall of Fame numbers because you do the math. Clearly, they're Hall of Fame statistics. But if you're not going there, and I felt somewhat validated by the old timers committee, whatever we call that thing, when they didn't go for Bonds and Clemens. So they're telling us to keep, you know, holding on to the wall there. So we hold on to the wall. After that, I guess Roland's the next guy. He's not a Hall of Famer in my view. I would not vote for him. I mean, he only played 142 or more games five times in like 18 seasons. Um, 281 career hitter, very good player. I still can't forget him going 0 for 15 in the World Series and 0 4 against the Red Sox. So, again, that's not fair, but uh, not quite Hall of Fame in my view. 100% right, Dan. I agree with you about Roland and I agree with you about Kent. You do a great job. Good to read you all the time. Thanks for joining us here today. Keep it up. Appreciate it. Thanks, Chris. Take care, man. You got it, Dan Shaughnessy. Blue Jays are next. Boy, Belt's going to help them if he stays healthy. Bassett, the whole nine yards. Uh, we have a nice conversation. Stick with us.